So hi, everybody. My name is Sean Fauclay, and today I'm pleased to present you the work I've been doing on the dorsal ventral axis specification in the CRTN embryo. This work has been done uh, in collaboration between the laboratory of Denis Thierry at the events and the laboratory of Thierry Lepage uh, at the IBV. So I'm working on the uh, CRTN embryo. So first of all, the CRTN embryo is uh, going through different stages along uh, its uh, larvae life. So it's shaped kind of uh, in a Eiffel Tower, you can see here. And during this larvae stage, uh, the embryo has to start specifying different axes of its body plan and notably the dorsal ventral axis. This uh, specific axis is composed of three different territories. So first you have the ventral territory that is in between the four arms. And then you have the dorsal territory in green here. And both of those are separated by a ciliary band in the middle shown in pink here. And the aim of the work uh, I've been doing is to try to understand how is the gene regulatory network uh, governing the different specification that is required to make those three different territories and to specify them uh, during the life cycle of the sea urchin. So to do so, so uh, we've been uh, working with in situ experiments that have been generated from the Lepage Laboratory at the Biology Institute of Valrose in Nice. And those experiments consist in in situ hybridization where we target specific genes with a digoxygen probe. And then uh, you can see under the microscope where are these uh, specific gene being expressed. So for example, taking three markers that are known to be specific to each of the three territories I have mentioned, we can see their patterns specifically. For example, nodal is a ventrally expressed TGF beta uh, transcription factor. You have uh, one kit, which is a ciliary marker and TBX23, which is a dorsal marker, as you can see here. In addition to this uh, well-type experiment, we also have access to gain and loss of function perturbation, where we either inject mRNA or inject morpholino to uh, perturb the expression of a given gene. So by either overexpressing over -expressing or uh, diminishing its expression. Using this perturbation, we can then again look at the expression of uh, the genes with uh, the uh, label and we can this way look at the, how the genes expression pattern is being influenced by changing a, a target gene expression. Uh, so we expect upon overexpression to see the target genes to be overexpressed also and upon loss of function to lose the expression as you can see here for the two example. So going from this uh, in-situ experiment, we built a network by uh, just creating edges and nodes, uh, in, like making a network where nodes represent the different proteins and edges represent the different regulatory interactions. And based on the in-situ experiment, we can add uh, new elements to the model. So for example, here in this uh, different set of different in-situ experiment, you can see the expression of cordin which is uh, ventrally expressed in well-time condition. But you can also see that upon a loss of function of either nodal or its ALK receptor, you lose cordine expression. And reversely, if you overexpress nodal or its receptor, cordine expression also goes uh, overexpressed. So using this, we can add to the network cordine as being downstream uh, of the nodal ALK receptor. So doing so, uh, in 2010, there have been already a first uh, gene regulatory network that have been made by the team of Thierry Lepage, consisting of 36 genes, uh, analyzed based on more than a thousand in situ experiments. And you can already see it can, uh, it already includes some specific markers of each of the three territories. The limitation in this network is that it's a static representation, meaning that there is no uh, notion of time ongoing uh, 
and there is no possibility to make simulations on this network, for example, by perturbing a single element and see how we will behave. And this is the aim of the study I'm presenting you now, which is the first aim was to build a dynamical model. So from this static GRN and by using a new set of formally defined rules to define the logic of the network and then using this rule to perform a simulation using logical formalism and the software GINSIM. In a second time, we also use this dynamical model to leverage its power toward a multicellular and a stochastic framework using a new set of tools, notably uh, Epilogue and Mabos. So first and foremost, how do we go from a static GRN to a dynamic GRN? It's by the addition of regulatory logic and logical rules for each node of the network. And to build uh, rules, we base, on self, uh, we base ourselves sorry, on the in-situ experiments also. So here, here is another example. You can see here that ADMP1 is another gene that is downstream of the uh, nodal ALK receptor pathway. And that you can see that it's not really expressed, overexpressed when nodal is overexpressed and uh, has its expression uh, disappear when we perturb either nodal or its receptor. In addition, you, this ADMP1 is also known to be uh, negatively regulated by the BMTP24 pathway, where uh, you can see in this uh, new in situ experiments that uh, having the BMP24 TGF beta or its receptor uh, having a loss of function, we see the expression pattern of ADMP1 that uh, expand on the, across the embryo, meaning that uh, we have a negative regulation here as shown by the red arrow in the model. And, for AD, and then for the ADMP1, we will uh, translate this uh, static GRN by building what we call regulatory rules uh, in a Boolean formalism by uh, translating this sentence where ADMP1 will tend toward a value of one, meaning it will be an active node in the network. If the upstream LK457 node is active, so also taking value one, and the dorsal ALK receptor is inactive, so taking value zero. In a Boolean formalism, this is translated into those two different symbols. And doing so for each of the elements of the network, we end up with the model, uh, a unicellular model as shown here, where each of the nodes, so again, represent the different proteins and each of the edges represent the interactions. You have the marker of each of the different territories shown in blue, pink, and green for the ventral, ciliary, and dorsal territory respectively. And the yellow nodes correspond to the input of the model, which are the nodes that have a value fixed upon the beginning of the simulation and will stay fixed all along the simulation. So it corresponds to the signal that is perceived by the cell. Okay, and most of the nodes have Boolean values, so either being active with a value of one or inactive with a value of zero. But to take into account some uh, concentration gradient uh, event, some of the nodes can take more than two values, for example, the ALK receptors and the SMAT proteins. So to simulate the model, we just need to fix the input values to a set of uh, of values that correspond to each of the territories. So for example, here, uh, if we activate the nodes that correspond to ventral signaling, so having these two and these three nodes active, and we simulate the model, we can propagate those rules across the downstream nodes and end up in a stable state. And you can see here with this configuration of uh, input nodes, we have all the ventral nodes that get activated and the final stable state correspond to a ventral simulation. In addition to this wild type simulation, we can also uh, make perturbation of the network by fixing one node to a value. For example, here, by fixing the uh, nodal receptor to a value of zero, 
it's the equivalent, equivalent of a loss of function for this receptor. And we can then compare the simulation with the expected result we have uh, by experimental condition experiments. And here in the simulation, you can see that with the same ventral input, input condition, having this loss of function prevents most of the ventral marker to be activated. So we've done that for a uh, well type condition as well as uh, different perturbations for each of the three territories. And we can see that most of the time we are able to recapitulate correctly the expected uh, pattern in the embryos. So both for wild type and for perturbation, except in one cases, which is the ventral territory in coordinate morpholinal conditions, meaning that uh, coordinate expression is knocked down. In experimental observation, we expect to have a fully dorsalized embryo, so also dorsal expression pattern in the ventral territory. But in our case, we can see that this, the model predicts both states to be possibly reachable in this condition. And with the model, we can dig a bit further into this uh, discrepancy and try to uh, understand why. And you can, so if we go into uh, this specific example, we can see that uh, during coordinate morpholinal simulation, it's a specific event where both uh, the ventral and the dorsal TGF beta pathway are active at the same moment without any inhibition, which means that both SMAT pathway uh, tend to get activated. However, those two SMAT pathway are sharing a common element, which is SMAT4. And because this factor could be limiting, we suggest that the competition between the two uh, pathway for SMAT4 prevents the uh, co-expression of both pathways, meaning that um, this could explain, potentially explain why we only see dorsal pathway in the uh, experimental ob observations. So uh, going further uh, into the model, we wanted to go to jump from unicellular to multicellular framework in order to be able to simulate in a single go the whole, the whole epithelium of the embryo instead of simulating uh, one territory at a time. And to do so, we, will, we used an epilog tool by where we built uh, an epithelium, a 2D epithelium, where one cell corresponds to a single instance of our unicellular model. And in addition, we add to the uh, next layer of regulatory rules where uh, the, that govern the diffusion in between the different cells of this epithelium. And these rules actually define the inputs that were previously fixed along the simulation. In the case of multicellular epithelium, the input value will be changed across the simulation based on the expression of the output uh, values of the surrounding cells. So for example, uh, in this example, the nodal input will take the value one if at least n cells express a nodal as an output of the model at the maximum distance of x cells. So by building diffusion rules, we can then simulate the embryo into a single epithelium, as I mentioned. And here is the simulation of wild type condition. We start with a maternal activator, a maternal repressor, sorry, which is panda, and a nodal uh, mRNA being present uh, all around the embryo. And starting from this, we can just let the model uh, run and propagate the, both the diffusion and the intercellular rules. In a first, time, uh, in a first step, you can see that uh, the expression of nodal and the MP24 get uh, spread across the whole embryo because we know that uh, in the model, nodal is an activator of both uh, nodal itself and BMP24. In the second time, the, uh, the presence of panda will tend to uh, repress the expression of nodal on the ciliary and dorsal side. So it will start to be uh, restricted to the ventral side and in parallel, the BMP24 
uh, production on the ventral side will diffuse toward the dorsal side of the embryo. And finally, we reach a stable state uh, as expected in the obs experimental observation where we have a ventral side uh, expressing nodal, a dorsal side expressing BMP24, although being produced from the ventral side, and a central CRA band. So to finish, we have uh, three distinct uh, regulatory mechanisms that have a, a key role for sustaining uh, a dorsal ventral IC specification. We have the nodal feedback that maintain a ventral organizer. We have the competition for SMAT4 that prevent both the nodal and the BMP24 uh, pathway to be co-expressed. And lastly, we have the diffusion of BMP24 from the ventral to the dorsal side that enable the, uh, the expression of the dorsal pathway. And with this, I will thank you all for uh, listening and will th thanks to two teams that have been working with this project and the Development Women Assembly for allowing me to present my work uh, to you today. So can you do transplantation experiments in surgeon? Like if you were to move some of those cells in different places, would you expect similar um, like cells that can't interpret the extracellular signals, if you were to move them dorsally, would you now expect a difference in pattern? Um, I, I think like, transplantation are possible. Like, for example, there is a like very old experiment on micromere transplantation. And for sure it's doable. And then I think the result will really depend on the timing of the transplants. If it's happened at the early stage of late stage of specification, that could be really a, a nice thing to check, yes. Right. Uh, we have a question from James Briscoe, actually, the Editor-in-Chief of Development. Uh, could you use overexpression of SMAT4 to test the interpretation that competition for SMAT4 determines the output in cells exposed to both BMP and nodal? Or does one signaling pathway always dominate? True, like that could be a potential experiment indeed. Because if, uh, if we overexpress SMAT4 in our hypothesis, we would uh, we would actually expect to see potentially the two tgf beta pathway active at the same time. But if there is another inhibition acting on, then it could be a, also a way to rule out this hypothesis. So that could be an interesting experiment to do. And, and the follow-up, is BMP2 and 4 diffusion, is it free or is it secreted through the ACM? So uh, I will need to... So I am not fully uh, expert in this question, but the diffusion is not free because it's mediated by some uh, other proteins. So for example, like cordin is known to diffuse uh, with, together with BMP24 and so on. So it's not just a free diffusion and hence the need to properly define diffusion rules for the simulation because all the diffusion are not uh, acting the same way. Cool, thank you very much.